everybody, thanks for watching this episode of Make Me Smart or listening to it while you're doing other things with YouTube playing in the background. I don't know how you do this. You want to subscribe to our YouTube channel? It is Marketplace APM. Also, click that like button while you're there, would you? Hook us up. Hook us up. Hook us up. Come on, it's not a bad line. Hook us up. That ought to be our tagline. I liked it. Welcome back. Welcome to Make Me Smart. Hook us up. Hey, everybody, I'm Kai Rizdahl. Hey, I'm Molly Wood. Welcome to another episode of Make Me Smart. Where, (laughs) hey, what do you know? Where every week, once again, here we are, just like clockwork, getting smart about tech, the economy, and culture. And of course, you guys always there helping us get smarter, uh, which is why we always say right here in this very spot, none of us is as smart as all of us. (laughs) Right in that very spot. (laughs) This is Uh, when it happens. That's right. We're going to do a little little something this week, and and honestly, uh, on and off the next couple of weeks and months that kind of goes into a conversation that we had like last year, Molly, was it last year or earlier this year about whether capitalism basically is working for people. I think of, yeah. of the, the series that we're going to start on today as sort of an outgrowth uh, of that. It's about the economics of inequality uh, in this society and what it means and, and maybe conceivably what can be done about it. Lots of parts of it, uh, lots of angles, not just one conversation, I promise you. So as I said, coming up uh, in the next weeks and months, lots of this stuff. Um, there is in this economy, lots of, um, economic inequality, race, gender, geography, you name it, whole bunch of sources, whole bunch of reasons why. And we're going to get to that today and in the coming weeks and months, we're going to start though, uh, with CEO compensation, um, how and why it has gotten so high, uh, especially where it can, when compared to average worker salary, right? That's the metric. That's sort of the, the, um, the bar against which a lot of the CEO pay stuff is measured. And we're going to talk about that. CEOs, we're talking here, making, you know, a thousand times more than what the average employee of their company they run makes. Um, has not always been that way. Um, we talked about it a little while ago, right, uh, with Abigail Disney getting all over Bob Iger, who runs her eponymous company, uh, making a gazillion dollars. She called it insane, um, which is really interesting coming from, you know, a woman who bears the company name, you know? Yeah, it was it was remarkable. And I think a lot of what we're going to talk about is, in fact, that ratio, not in the Twitter way, but Mm -hmm. the ratio, (laughs) like the difference between what your lowest paid employee makes and what your CEOs make. Um, I just learned, in fact, that the most glaring example of CEO pay is actually Elon Musk, whose total compensation adds up to around two point three billion dollars, the biggest yearly salary ever. And that's well, just. We, we, I mean, anyway, we, we, we should say we should say most of the, virtually all of that is options, right? So that's you know, if it's the all, company right. goes kerflu, he gets bupkis, which is a huge part of this conversation that we right. are going to get right. to. Absolutely, but these CEO salaries do they are going up at twice the rate of ordinary wages. So that seemed like the the most obvious place for us to start when we in our little mini series here about the economics of inequality. We're going to take a little spin through the history of how we got to this place. Uh, and talk about the mechanics that allowed for it to happen. So here to discuss it with us is Heather Boucher. She's the executive director of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. What a concept. Welcome, Heather. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Equitable growth. I, I just... Yeah. How do we it's do little, that? Little oxymoronic, right? I don't mean to jump to oh. the end here, but yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be oxymoronic. We used to grow together. We used to be a country where when the economy grew, people up and down the income spectrum grew. And so we think that the evidence points to the fact that we could do it again. It just requires just a, you know some, some uh, big changes in our policy well, environment. Give us the elevator pitch history lesson. I mean, because it wasn't always this way, right? Mm-hmm. No, it wasn't always this way. And, um, you know, when you look over the post-World War II period, you know, kind of going back to the 1950s um, or or 60s, you know, we have um, this data that we look at each quarter called the um, gross domestic product. We look at what's happening to our Mm -hmm. aggregate economy. And one of the things that um, economists have been doing is is attaching actual data on who gains when the economy grows onto those measures of aggregate national income growth um, to give us a sense of, you know, who's who's benefiting. And yeah. what they found is super fascinating that, you know, between over the 1960s and 70s, when the economy grew, almost everybody in America saw their incomes grow at about the same pace. And in fact, those mm. at the top saw their incomes grow slower than the average, and those at the bottom saw their incomes grow faster. And since um, about 1980, you've seen the opposite. And in fact, 90% of Americans are seeing their incomes grow slower than the average growth overall. 
And so much of that is about the things that we want to talk about today, about CO pay and what's happening at the top. But we used to be a country of, of equitable growth. We are no longer, but we can really point to what's changed in our society and, and uh, try to undo those things. What was it? <laughs> well, I mean, what happened in the 1980s? Yeah. You know, was it the yeah, was it Ronald was it Reagan? Perhaps was it a change in happened, tax yeah. rates? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's so many things. Um, totally happy to go right into that. Um, you know, <laughs> yeah, let's one. Do I mean, it, it's a it's a big question, but right. I mean, one certainly taxes change. How we thought about taxes changed, right? Um, and actually, let me take it one step back. It's it's not any one thing that changed, but a whole set of different um, ways of thinking about the economy and um, how markets work that said, you know what, markets work best when they are, quote unquote, left to their own devices. And in fact, anything that we do that supports institutions or that addresses inequality is actually bad for growth. And, you know, we now know decades later that actually what that's done is, you know, we've we've decreased taxes at the top by significant amount um, in, in numerous iterations, you know, culminating, of course, in 2017 with the Trump tax cuts. And we were told that that would lead to stronger, broadly shared growth. And that's not what we've seen. Growth on average has been lower since the 80s than it was in those decades before. And of course, that growth mm -hmm. hasn't been shared. Um, we've changed how we think about um, uh, how big firms can get and whether or not government should make sure that there's competition in the market. So we've allowed firms to increasingly become become concentrated with fewer and fewer firms dominating in, in, in industries all across um, the economy. And that, of course, has meant that an, a smaller number of people are taking home the gains from growth. It's not good for competition. It's not good for consumers. And it's certainly not good for workers. And we've deconstructed the institutions that that pushed for equitable growth, and first and foremost, unions. You know, there's been a 50-year campaign to, you know, decimate unions in the United States, and it's been successful to the extent that there are fewer people in private sector unions today than there were before we made them legal, or we, before we made strikes legal, back in the 1930s. And um, those campaigns have really meant that there's no bulwark against um, rising economic concentration and rising wealth inequality. So. Okay. And then, of course, all that plays out into politics. So, I mean, that's just the meta narrative, but a lot right. changed in those decades. So, mm -hmm. so part of that narrative and part of the aggregation of wealth has gone to the corporate side, right? So, you've got uh, much bigger companies now, much more powerful companies with CEOs, just to get it to the topic of, of today's discussion, who have much more oomph in this economy. And uh, for some reason, it has become accepted practice to pay those uh, CEOs many thousands, not many thousands, but certainly at least a thousand multiples of what the average, you know, Disney park worker makes. Um, do, you, do you agree with the thesis that it's become acceptable somehow? I mean, it kind of has because it's just kind of kept on going. It's it's certainly become the norm, right? Yeah, and, the norm, right? You know, Better so, word, yeah. Yeah, there's there's no and there's so many things that go into that. But once you've created this culture where it's perfectly acceptable for one CA, CEO to make you know so much more mm -hmm. than the average worker, and you've got so many of these folks sitting on these interlocking boards, um, you have different policies that encourage um, uh, stock options, which you know as you sort of already noted with them. Um, uh, Elon. Elon Musk, yeah. yeah, as being a huge part of his compensation. You know, you had changes in the tax code that um, encouraged those instead of pay, but so it allowed that to skyrocket a little bit. But, you know, you kind of have to look back to what happened in the 70s and 80s to understand, you know, what changed about those norms. But then moving forward, it's now socially acceptable, right? Um, so now we have this these multi-layered problems, right, that, you know, how do you push back on something that's become... Um, you know, uh, just so, yeah. so widely, yeah, and widely prevalent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then would it be, is the, I mean, it seems to me that, that CEO pay is one thing by itself, but it's the inequality that has made us start to discuss it. Like, would it be a big deal if Elon Musk made $2.3 billion a year in stock if his lowest paid employee made 150000 it's an it's a really interesting question, Molly. And I think, you know, this is one that I think people have been struggling with for the past 
a uh, few decades. It's certainly one, you know, when I came to Washington, um, I started out a think tank in 2000, and I remember asking one of my colleagues that question. Um, you know, I was started right out of fresh out of graduate school and super excited to be in D.C. and excited to be thinking about these issues. And, you know, um, was looking to, to someone who was more experienced in policymaking and was kind of like, well, yeah, you know, I mean, if we raise the minimum wage, if we focus on boosting, you know, the salaries of uh, middle class families, should we really care about those at the top? And, mm -hmm. you know, the evidence that's come out over the past um, few decades really does push the, to the conclusion that if you have this, even if um, the middle class folks, you know, are perhaps doing okay, um, as long as you have this extremely high inequality, um, that has these effects on our, econ on our economy and on our society and on our political process in ways that make, and you can see this playing out in our economy today, that make it more likely that that kind of high inequality will continue to increase. And then you won't see the kinds of investments in boosting middle class incomes or investments in goods and services for middle class and lower income consumers or any of the other things that are going to drive strong growth moving forward. So I think at this point, the weight of the evidence is, yes, it does really matter if a handful of people are taking home these outsized gains um, for reasons of economics and also democracy and, you know, the ways that that translates into political and social power. Um, mm -hmm. So so let me ask you a, a uh, well, there will be a series, but I'll sprinkle them through the next uh, six or eight minutes. But but here's the first of my of my uh, I'm going to poke you in the eye a little bit questions. Uh, and the first one goes like this. There are only a handful of people. Uh, who can, just to pick on Bob Iger for a minute, right, who can run a company like that, right, who can do what he's done with that company in the last 20 years for the company's shareholders, for the value that consumers get out of ESPN and Pixar and Star Wars and all that good stuff. Why shouldn't he make $56 million a year? It's a great question. And I think that the answer lies in looking at the economy as a whole system, not necessarily looking at any one individual. So, yeah, I mean, certainly you want to create incentives for, for people to invest in their own human capital and their own talents and their abilities, get themselves educated, get themselves skills. You want to create opportunities for people to innovate and reap the rewards of that, um, of their hard work and, and putting their talent to use. But the challenge comes when as a society, we allow that process to lead to s fewer and fewer people at the top reaping more and more of the gains for themselves um, because it closes off opportunity for everybody else and it mm. subverts and distorts the whole economy. So it's so I think that your question, and I think I love that poke you on in the eye question because it does, it makes it about the people, right? And that's what, you know, when we're thinking about the economy, mm -hmm. sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, you really do want to focus on those individuals. But so let me let me give you back a data point from a research study sure. that, that I think is a good counterpoint to this. Give, give, so, give me a poke um, back. That's that's what it's all yeah. about. Yeah. So um, Raj Chetty um, was on our, st yeah. our steering committee as a founding member. And um, at our first grantee done, done, conference. Done, done lots of work. We should say who Raj Chetty is, right? Lots of work on yeah. economic yeah. inequality and mobility in this society. Lots. I mean, he's done some foundational work. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Totally. And um, he came and gave a lunchtime talk um, at our first conference um, of all the grantees and, and folks we support. And um, this study has um, since then been, ma been made public, but it was this really just um, super interesting study about how um, he connected the dots, him and a, call, and a group of people, connected the dots between data on who gets patents on mm. what their incomes are, what their third grade test scores were in math, what their family income was when they were in third grade. So you know about mm. this, this per person who's got a patent as an adult and their childhood experience. And what he found, he and his colleagues found, was, you know, lo and behold, um, people who did good on third grade math tests more likely to grow up and become innovators, more likely to apply for and receive patents as an adult. Well, that seems totally logical, mm. right? Like, you know, common mm -hmm. sense. What he also found is that if you just look at the kids that did well on those third grade tests in math, the children from wealthier families four times as likely to grow up and get patents. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with Bob Iger being able to reap some gains from the fact that he's talented. 
But I really want all of those other talented people to also be able to enter the economy, and I want all of us to benefit from their talents as well. So we have to really investigate what goes wrong, why some people aren't able to move up the ladder, and the extent to which that is because concentrated economic uh, 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 concentrated economic resources leads to distortions and subversions of our economy because that affects our politics and our society. And it, you don't really have to look further than recent headlines to see the way that wealthy elites have decided that their kids don't need to be mer mm -hmm. meritous mm -hmm. to get into college. They can buy their mm -hmm. way in. That I mean, that offends so many different things, but what it fundamentally says is that if you allow some people to garner more and more in the gains, they are going to make sure that they and their children hold on to those gains. And that right. that will, and mm -hmm. it is, stifling innovation, and it's stifling productivity, and it's stifling growth. So, so how do um, we, yeah. you know, we're, so now I think... You know, not to toot our own horn, but we're at least having this conversation. We're having this, we're, but we're toot. having we're having this conversation because Abigail Disney started this. You know, I mean, this is this is happening. People are starting to discuss this. There are conversations about whether CEO pay is too far out of line with average worker pay. However, despite the power of the argument that you make, I, if I'm Bob Iger, I'm still like, yeah, not my problem. You know, so I wonder when you're facing an entrenchment that has already happened, what is the argument that you can make to the sort of CEO class, right, or the boards or the shareholders in these public companies that says we're going to have to lower this CEO pay or worse, you're the new baby CEO and you just don't get paid as much because we are trying to make a more equitable society. That and therein lies the the question under my, mm -hmm. you know underlying so much of American politics and has for quite some time. But you can definitely see this question playing out in so many different ways. I'm so, you know, I'm so glad we're starting to have these conversations. You know, last week or a few days ago, um, uh, you know, you have seen wealthy elites come come to the table and say, we do need to do wealth taxes. We do need to start thinking mm -hmm. about this, and that's been very exciting to see people stand up and say this is important. I actually think in the conversations that I've had with um, with folks at the top end of the income spectrum, you know, the the idea that they're that that the smart children of tomorrow should be able to move their way up, I do think is a compelling one because it's about what we believe in as a society. It's about the fact that we think that what makes American capitalism so great and has made it so vibrant is that it that it provides this opportunity for innovation and for good ideas to bubble up. Um, so I think we can tap into that. We can tap into this idea of patriotism, that if we want the United States to be a strong economy in 10, 20, 30, you know, 40, 50 years at the end of, the, of this century, um, this is the most important economic issue that we're going to have to confront um, because mm. otherwise we're going to become a stale, some kind of aristocracy. I don't know what we'll call it, but um, that it's it's calcifying wealth in, in ways that isn't going to be good for all of us. So I would tap into those values. But, you know, Molly, your question really is also about, about political power. And I think that mm -hmm. the most challenging aspect of all of this is the way that high wealth inequality, high CO pay has, um, you know, subverted our politics and has, you know, is behind so many of the um, policies that are increasing inequality or where we're not doing anything to address it. And I would point again to the, the Trump tax cuts where you know, polls have shown since that bill, you know, when it was being debated, when it passed, and today the American people weren't for it, and yet it passed. Um, and, you know, when you look at the, the records of what we know of how many CEOs were in there meeting with Donald Trump to talk about it relative to the power of, you know, the public that wants a different policy agenda, this is, um, you know, this influence of economic inequality is important. So here we have, just, just to round it out, right, and sort of look to the future, here we have, uh, we're on the cusp of the 2020 campaign, uh, well, deep into the cusp, I suppose. Uh, you've got Elizabeth Warren, right, on the Democratic side uh, talking about this. You've got Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side talking about this. Is there, beyond a political stump speech, uh, is there a actually an organized movement or a chance for change on this, do you believe? 
I'm an economist, uh, you know, and I'm not. Yeah. So I shouldn't be. Pre- I shouldn't be, you know, making predictions about politics. Is what do I know? You know, and economists were terrible at forecasting, right? That's what they say. I mean, you know, what I have been seeing, um, you know, building over the past few decades. Um, so I'll point to a few things. One is that you see an increasing awareness among economists that inequality matters for how the economy works. Um, So you see so many scholars who are now seeking to understand the ways that inequality actually affects our understanding of how firms work, how... um, uh, you know, how we think about both the production side and the distribution side, what it means for macroeconomic uh, outcomes and, and therefore macroeconomic policymaking. So you're seeing people really take that seriously and coming to the consensus that, wow, it it does matter and it is having this distortionary effect. So that that gives me some hope that there's a lot of evidence about the effects of inequality and high pay for some. Um, you're also seeing the emerging generation uh that, that we've been connecting with at Equitable Growth of, of thought leaders who are doing econ policy who are asking this question as well and asking, well, what is it that we can do on the policy side? Hmm. Now, on the, you know, on the advocacy and politics side, I mean, this has been bubbling up for decades, right? Occupy was about, you know, the 99% versus the 1%, you know, quoting, you know, Piketty and Saez's research in this sure. um, in mm-hmm. this way, which was, you know, as an economist, very exciting to see um, data points, <laughs> making it out there into the public discourse. Um, but, you know, you're also seeing the the, the frustration, right? You, you know, when you look into how people understood the 2016 election and how people are thinking about... Um, you know, uh, voters' views, this frustration with an economy that doesn't deliver, which is real, which shows up in the data, and that they want people to do something, politicians aren't going to be able to get around that. So something's going to give. Right. It sounds like ultimately you're saying it has to become sort of culturally entrenched. And maybe it's not fair to say Bob Iger is sitting there saying it's not my problem. Maybe, you know, these people are smart enough to realize that it should be their problem and that they just don't necessarily need to be grossly Wealthy. Maybe there will become a new new norm where, where people say, ooh, I have too much money. That's kind of embarrassing. Hope springs eternal. Maybe, yeah. Hope springs eternal, yeah. but it, it will require political action. So, <laughs> Heather Boucher is the executive director of the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. I will mm. never get over loving that. Heather, thank you so much yeah. for the time. Heather, thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, there we go. Outstanding. Also a good place to note that the um, the United States has just scored. It's two to one. Ah, well, there we go. In the Women's Thanks World Cup. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to know. Just a quick, just a quick uh, follow-up so you, before we go into that's our That's right. We got the soccer but... thing. So we've got, uh, we've got, uh, there's, there was installment one, actually, of, you know, economic inequality yes. in the society. So if you are either a CEO, uh, actually, so look, if you're Bob Iger, call us. Uh, but if you're any other kind of CEO or, or uh, a worker who's interested in this, uh, drop us a line. Let us know. Send us a voicemail. Yeah. It's uh, make really me smart at marketplace.org. That's such a great point. Like, I really want to know what Elon Musk 2.0 is thinking, right? Like, who is the who is the the hot startup CEO who's saying, "I'm going to make my compensation dependent on yeah, other things," or "I'm going to right? set a Those moral are cap." Out there for sure, yeah, they're definitely out there, and I and they're probably younger than Bob Iger. But you yes. know, call us. Uh, yeah, yes, make me smart All at right. marketplace.org. Like Kai said, time for a break, and then our thoughts. A little tricky this week since I'm not there. All right, we're back. I don't know if I got the timing right or not, but I guess we will. Fi- we'll fix it in post, as they say. We'll fix it in post. I know um, we we talk about it, and then people yeah. hear it, and they're like, well, "I don't understand." <laughs> it was about. fine. You guys shut up. I don't it's know. Funny to me. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, you go first. And oh, look, you have one, and only one. I should. Say. I do, and I have only one. I'm working on it. I'm going to turn this ship around. I'm so proud of um, you. I went to. In in highly unexpected development in my career as a mostly technology business journalist, I went to a sustainability conference last week. And it was, yeah. you know, because we're doing this series on climate change and adaptation. And I learned that just in the last year or two, there has been a really big corporate oversight change. Like that companies used to have governance goals, just governance goals. And mm-hmm. that in the last year or two, environmental and sustainability goals have been added to governance Mm -hmm. so that there's this metric called ESG that companies have to meet uh, with their board members and shareholders and all of that. Mm -hmm. 
and with certification boards. And that that has led to, and this actually, this should totally be a marketplace feature. I think it's really interesting. That's led to a whole lot of new openings for chief sustainability officer roles. Oh, yeah. That sort of like didn't used to exist anymore or didn't used to exist at a really high level. And I think that's a fascinating labor story. But then relevant to our conversation today, I found this article uh, from just today in the Wall Street Journal about how some companies are actually linking executive pay to sustainability targets. And so they're saying that if you don't make progress against these ESG mm-hmm. goals, you won't get your full bonus. You won't get paid. Hmm. And in this sort of ongoing conversation about like how to tackle climate change and what are the incentives and what are the um, economic drivers... I thought right. that was super interesting and, of course, yeah, for sure. highly relevant to today's discussion. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yep. It, look, this stuff matters and people are beginning to realize it. That's that's actually what's going on here, right? And it's They really are. And if, you can, if you're going to have crazy, you know, CEO pay, then at least right. say your pay isn't going to be that crazy unless you are meaningfully reducing greenhouse gas emissions, just as yep. one example. Yep. Just to, you know, save the planet. Uh, All right. So mine is I'm keying off a column in the Financial Times uh, about the Federal Reserve. But uh, really, uh, I want to point out two things. At the end of this week, we will be in we will be tied for the longest peacetime expansion in the history of the American economy since 1850 and something, um, which is 10 years, 120 months come the end of this week, which is kind of amazing given all that has been going on the past 10 years. I mean, part of it was recovery from the Great Recession. Yes. But then there has been shall we say, political turmoil uh, in this country. There has been regulatory change. There's been all kinds of stuff going on, which has been totally fascinating. Uh, But the other thing I want to talk about, and the reason I'm commending this article to you, uh, is that um, it's actually a column. It's not an article. uh, By Rana Furuhar. She writes for the Financial Times. uh, And she points out something that is actually true, that the Federal Reserve now, as it turns to lowering interest rates instead of raising them, seemingly on the turn of a dime, um, has over the past generation or so done a lot to um, make economic expansions last longer. And her point is that sometimes a continually expanding economy is not necessarily the best thing. You need a little, just like in wildfire management, if I could you know, make an unfortunate comparison, you need to clean out the underbrush every now and then. And that sometimes is what recessions can do. Um, and hmm. the Fed has been changing the way it's managing this economy from, you know, s- strictly fixating on its dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment to, oh, let's keep the expansion going, uh, which is exactly what Jay Powell said at his last press conference. He said, we're going to do whatever hmm. we have to do, in essence, to keep the expansion going. So anyway, that's that. Congratulations, 10-year uh, economic boom, and we'll see what happens. That's – There we go. What's – that is super interesting – and relates I th- or could relate to this conversation too, which is like here we are in a long expansion that not everyone is feeling. Yep. And oh yeah, for sure. Still. And if there were a recession, the question is, would it hurt the same people who have not yet felt the expansion, or would it clear out some of the underbrush of say inflated CEO pay or gigantic companies that are, you know, so unsustainably large that they would just tip Spoil- over under their own weight. Spoil, I'm going to spoiler alert. You're going dark place, aren't yeah, spoiler you? Spoiler yeah, alert. Here comes. I don't, I'm not going there. It's there. The people who will be hurt <laughs> by the next recession are the same people who were hurt by the Great Recession. And no, it will not cut Bob Iger's pay. Not to keep picking on Bob Iger, but, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I, re- I reject that application of the dark place thing. I reject it fully. <laughs> Well, look, some companies go out of business. I mean, I was here in the dot com. I've been recently obsessed with the dot com bust yeah. in, the, yeah. in 2001, 2002. I mean, that cleared yeah. out a lot of companies that didn't have good business models. Yes. Like if we didn't yes. have, but, but, if, we, if the but, easy access to capital were not enabling something, somebody like Uber to raise however many right. hundreds of billions of dollars of private money, then yeah. maybe, yeah, you're right. Sorry, then all I those employees have, would just have, get fired. And I just have to look up Travis the stock ticker here for fine. a minute. I, I will point out that Petco went under because Petco was a terrible business model, right? Right? There was nothing. There was no there there. I will also now point out that a Pets. company com. named Chewy, Pets. Pets. Com. Sorry. It's a, yeah. Uh, a company named Chewy has recently gone public uh, and is worth something like, I can't even figure out what it is here. Uh, yeah. yeah. Rid- ridiculous enthusiasm is the is the headline. So, you know. About Chewy? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Look, I, <laughs> look, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm not saying there's not a bubble. I'm just saying Chewy is a yeah. good business. Yeah. 
I really right, like anyway. how they bring me my dog. Shall we? Anyway. Yeah. All right. Your what turn. Are we doing? Hi, Kai and Molly. Oh, my God. This is Brent from Detroit. Detroit. This is Rebecca from Baltimore. <laughs> it was great to hear comments on my question about GDPR. I wanted to put in my vote. I want to discuss a slightly different but maybe related thing. All right. Down Don't with that. All. Lots of feedback on our facial recognition episode last week. Daniel Wright from Oakland, California. Uh, he sent this. Here you go. I remember back when I first found out that my um, my cell phone was tracking everything I did. I was horrified and then, you know, turned off the tracking apps and all that stuff for a year. And then at some point I was just like, whatever, they're going to find me if they want to find me. And I think that facial recognition is going to be the same thing. I just don't know if we're not just a bunch of frogs getting oiled slowly. Ribbit, ribbit. <laughs> That's what I think. That I had that right. thing. I had that thing happen yeah. recently with a friend where we had a conversation in the back of a lift about a product, and then imme- immediately the next day that product showed up in an ad in his Instagram, and he was like, "I haven't searched no way. for this." Like, you know, we just had no yeah, way. Like we just had a conversation, and nobody hasn't had this happen, right? Like you can't tell I haven't me had that happen. That really? Sorry. Oh yeah. man, I've had it happen, and this was so stark. I mean, it was literally like I only wow. ever buy these. I, I like to buy these Richardson hats. I haven't bought one in like 10 years. And literally wow. the next day it shows up in the Instagram feed. And I'm like, what? come on. Like we're not even getting boiled slowly. We're at a <laughs> we're at a fast clip. Fire it up. Put them in the microwave. All right. Anyway, sorry. Unfortunate image. <laughs> oh, you go next. Gross. Kelly <sighs> Kelly Clark Martin from Orlando, Florida, uh, said she thinks it's interesting that San Francisco is the first place to ban facial recognition and that it may be no accident, actually. It seems as though people in San Francisco, due to the proximity to Silicon Valley, would be probably the most aware of the possible side effects and and harm of this technology, and yet uh, they're also the first people to ban it. Uh, almost as though they're saying it's good enough for other people, but we don't want it here. Well, yes. Well, also, San Francisco okay. is politically liberal and progressive, and, you know, there's that. Well, right? and also San Francisco's lawmakers, I think, have had, felt like that. Right. it's more that San Francisco's lawmakers have freaking right. had enough with the yeah. uh, with the the excesses of the valley. but. You make you do raise a good point, which is that like a lot of these schools, a lot of these private schools that and charter schools that the Valley has funded for themselves have way less technology mm-hmm. in them. You know, so there there are certainly some of the realizations about the harms are coming faster. But I think if anything, you could say that this is more of a reaction to the tech industry there, being next door yeah. by the lawmakers who are like, enough. Yeah, there is some cognitive dissonance there with Silicon Valley, I'll tell you that. Uh, all right, Imunz Mosseni is worried about facial recognition hitting the market in a bigger way. Here you go. There have been lots and lots of data breaches these past few years. These companies and agencies that had data stolen, a lot of them sometimes reassure us by telling us that most of what was stolen was encrypted. Well, it was stolen, and once quantum computing is out there, I'm betting that most of these folks weren't using quantum-resistant encryption. I'm not taking that bet because it's almost certainly true that they were not using quantum-resistant encryption. Yes? Yes. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So all those stolen yeah. troves. Man, I have to say that I did not even consider this. The existing stolen troves of data that have been unlockable so far and master keys are getting built yeah, yeah. right now. For sure. That's a For sure. freaking... Bummer. Uh, all right. The make me smart <laughs> okay. question is next, I believe, Ms. Wood. Yes. <laughs> oh, Lord. Sorry. I'm just contemplating the, the darkness. Um, yes. Time for the make me smart question. What is something you thought you knew that you later found out you were wrong about? Neil Stevenson is one of my favorites. I'm not going to lie. Sci-fi writer and author. Uh, and he has a new book out called Fall that is essentially about the horrors of social media and the end of death. In typical Neil I'm Stevenson sorry, the fashion, end this of death? Come as a surprise. Yeah, right. like digitally okay. uploading your consciousness so that death kind of goes away, and then what happens? And then the mind body problem. It's really you should read, you, you might like it. It's really good. Anyway, okay. I uh, mentioned in last week's show that I was reading the book, and that's because we're interviewing him on Marketplace Tech tomorrow. And while he was on the line, of course, we asked him the make me smart question, and here's his answer. One thing that I used to assume is that. 
people actually believed in what they said they believed in, um, which seems it seems kind of obvious. But um, people, you know, said that they were a libertarian or a Christian or a conservative or what have you. That 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 actually meant that they had a body of beliefs that they yeah. actually did believe in, and that you could have conversations with them on that basis. And um, now I don't think that anymore. Now I think it's more that those are just signifiers of, of tribal identification. It's like being a Bears fan versus being a Packers fan. <laughs> um, and so facts and argument have absolutely nothing to do with it. I think that is a thousand percent true. Sign me up for that one. Yep. Yep. Right? Agreed. Totally. Yeah. Totally. <sighs> You can hear uh, uh, that, tomorrow, that interview. Yes. yes. Yeah. There you go. Actually, it's a two-parter. So today and uh -huh. tomorrow, uh, Monday and no. Tuesday. Yes. Because much like a Neil Stevenson book, which is a thousand pages long, there was too much in there for just one piece. Gotcha. Gotcha. Also, don't the forget the newsletter, end. people. Don't forget the newsletter. Sign up at marketplace.org slash newsletters. It's really, really good, actually. You totally learn it's stuff, so which good. I just think is awesome. Yeah, totally. Marketplace.org slash newsletters is where you find oh, that. I'm not say that. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just going to say it again. Make Me Smart is produced by Shara Morris. Tony Wagner is our digital producer. Our senior producer is Eve Tro. And thank you to our video producers, Ben Hethcote and Summer Dunsmore. Special thanks this week to Jody Becker sitting in the producer chair. Oh, totally true. Uh, video done this week, by the way. Also audio in New York where I am by Sarah Baguer because I'm traveling and I'm not there. Uh, this week's program, I'm just going to take it on faith, was engineered by Jake Orsky. I can't see him. Theme music composed by Ben Talladay and Daniel Ramirez. The executive director of On Demand is Sutar Nieves. The senior vice president and general manager is one Deborah Clark. Hi, Deb. Thanks for listening. If you actually are. Just, uh, just, just testing. Just, te just, just <laughs> testing. Uh, we crack us up. <laughs>